coming up on the Health Feast. Exercise is a classic example. Many people don't exercise. And exercise is perhaps the strongest medication we know of. It, it treats everything. <laughs> You're less likely to die of any cause if you exercise. You're less likely to have depression. It treats depression. It improves our gut microbiome. It improves our heart. It builds our muscles and strength such that if we were to get sick from any cause, we'd be more likely to recover faster. That's what exercise does, okay? That's how powerful it is. In insane. And yet most people don't meet the guidelines for exercise, but many people don't exercise at all. Everybody knows it's good for them. And so what's that disconnect? I think when you say the, the word exercise, it's like, it's a chore. When you say exercise to me, there's uh, nothing appealing about exercise, uh, right? Yeah. It's like, uh, it's like another thing I have to do. Yeah. Not a, not a, like I get to, you know, I get to do like hiking, you know, when you say hiking, it kind of, you know, you, you're thinking of what you get to go see and all that. But when you say mm. exercise, I'm thinking of like, oh, I got to go like PE class. You're right. That word connotes a chore to a lot of people. So when I'm talking to someone, we want to help them start moving more. I ask them, first of all, what do you like to do? What types of movement feel good to you? What types of movement don't feel good to you? Because if you get knee pain when you run, running is probably not the movement you should do because that is not a health feast. That is a health chore. Okay. Hi, Poe. What's going on, Rock? Good morning. Good morning. Welcome back, everyone. Welcome back to the Health Feast, where... What is our tagline for this show? <laughs> I think it, like, changes. You know what I mean? It like, because it's just... Every, it we, it, we it, it like, I, evolves. Okay, so somebody asked me, a friend of mine who, who I had listened to this, he asked me, what, what is it that you're trying to accomplish? And I didn't answer him, but I thought we would answer that question together. Yeah. I know the answer, but wait, what's your answer? You know, I just, I, I feel like, I think change comes from the individual, from the person. So for me, the more I learn from our conversations, it helps me in my own walk with health. So uh, for me, it is it is a place where people, or I come to actually learn how to improve my health. But what I'm finding is that as I grow as a human being, you know, it, it I feel like the feast, the health feast is also growing too, you know? Mm. So what I deal with on my own personal daily life, I kind of come here to, you know, kind of learn more about how to improve myself. Mm. So I feel like it's a, it's a place, um, it's a space, I should say, where one can come and, you know, and, and sort of look internally in their own lives. You know, that's what I do when I'm talking with you is I'm always like applying some of the things that we, you know, that we talk about. And hmm. because I, I, from even from when we first talked about creating this, it's even evolved even more. And what's interesting is that it's, it's like a real, you're like in the, you're in the health feast. You know what I mean? Like you're, for me, it's like, I'm actually dealing with my own shortcomings and challenges and you know some of my you know my victories as well it's all happening in real time and so for mm -hmm. for me when i you know when we when we have these conversations i just think it's a space where people can come to learn how to live better you know um okay yeah that, that's that's how i feel that's what i feel the health feast is well i love me. that i love that you said uh that you're in it it's a reminder that we're both in this. Uh, we're all in this. It's it's kind of a mindset. Mm. Yeah, I'm gonna say that it's it's a I mindset like because it, the word feast it conveys the sense of enjoyment, of savoring. I like to say indulgence. You know, we and we think of feast 
with food typically. So what do you think of like a feast? You think of like abundance, 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 Abundance. and the best and the best, like the best meaning the most, like, it's just really fulfilling. It feels really Mm. good. Food tastes really good. It's super enjoyable. It looks really good. But then when you say the word health, I, that's not what comes to mind for a lot of people, you know, for a lot of people, what comes to mind is um, restriction, boring, (laughs) something I have to do, something that's good for me. So the, it's a mindset. It's really, first of all, an acknowledgement that health it doesn't have to be any of those things. Like it is those things. It is good for you, but that's not the way you have to perceive it or experience it on a regular basis. I think that's a, I think the shifting, I I think that's, I think people are way more aware of health now than because of COVID. I think people are now, Hmm. I feel like, people are taking health a little more serious. Those who would have normally not, I think now I feel like there's a, there's a small shift that I, I feel like that's what's happening now. Just from conversations that I've had with people, I feel like, like there's, you know, I feel like going through the pandemic, it's like people are way more aware of like eating healthy because it could help them, you know, fight off the virus. You know what I mean? So just, just from conversations that I've had. I think you're right. I think, um, think more people are becoming aware of health yeah and that's why i think framing health it in a particular Mm. mindset is so important and talking about it you know i exercise is um Mm. a classic example many people don't exercise okay and exercise is perhaps the strongest medication we know of Wow. It, it treats everything. <laughs> You're less likely to die of any cause if you exercise. Okay? You're less likely to have depression. It treats depression. It improves our gut microbiome. It improves our heart. It builds our muscles and strength such that if we were to get sick from any cause, we'd be more likely to recover faster less likely to spend time in the hospital for that infection. That's what exercise does, okay? That's how powerful it is. Insane. And yet most people don't meet the guidelines for exercise, but many people don't exercise at all. There's that disconnect. Everybody knows it's good for them. I don't think you would ask a single person and ask them, is exercise good for you? Would anyone say no? And so what's that disconnect? I'll pose that to you. Um, Well, I think they, I think when you say the the word exercise, it's like, it's a chore, you know, it's like, oh man, exercise. It's such a, it's a, (laughs) it's a term that was used for a long time now. And I feel like when you say exercise to me, there's Uh, nothing appealing about exercise uh, when uh, you say it, right? Yeah. It's like, uh, it's like another thing I have to do. Yeah. Not a, not a, like I get to, you know, I get to do, you know, I get to go do something, you know? So for me, um, but I think that's the thing that's changing. Like, even if you, if you look at those who, you know, participate in certain like hiking, you know, when you say hiking, it kind of, it's a different you know, you, you're thinking of what you get to go see and all that. But when you say mm-hmm. exercise, I'm thinking of like, oh, I got to go like PE class, you know, <laughs> like so this, PE. So this is this is so hiking is is the health feast. OK, hiking is a health feast because it's just what you I, I totally, totally agree. I mean, this is what we see eye to eye on. Right. And exercise. You're right. That word connotes a chore to a lot of people. So <clears throat> instead of using exercise, I usually nowadays when I'm talking to patients, I say movement. Essentially, that's what you're doing. You're you're going from a sedentary, from being sedentary to, to movement. 
And and here's what I always say. I say, first of all, when we're deciding, when I'm talking to someone and we want to start, they want to, we want to help them start moving more. I ask them, first of all, what do you like to do? What types of movement feel good to you? What types of movement don't feel good to you? Because if you get knee pain when you run, well, we can address the knee pain for sure. But running is probably not the movement we should, you should do. Mm-hmm. Because that is not a health feast. That is a health chore. Mm. Mm. Got it. That is a health chore. So the health feast is really, oh, I like dancing. Okay. How can we make dancing intentional movement in your life so that you get the benefits of movement and you're doing something that you enjoy? And so it's not just saying, I like dancing, let me dance once in a while. It's saying, okay, if you like dancing, maybe we can find some sort of class that you can go to three times a week. Or you're going to schedule in like just freestyle dancing at home, like certain times. And you're going to be intentional about the time and It's just like what we talked about when we set a SMART goal for you. You're going to be intentional about all those things because that's how you learn whether or not you're consistent. And that way you can iterate. You can get better. You can figure out if you're not doing something, why you're not doing it. And this all presupposes that your goal is to improve your life, improve your health. For the purpose of, and we keep going back to it, but the purpose of living that aspiration, that aspirational self-identity, that type, being the type of person that you want to be, living, having the life that you want. If that is your intention, if that is your goal, then the way you do that is by being consistent with certain habits. And the way you build in consistency is by doing things that feel good to you, that you enjoy. And you do you do hard things because they feel good to you. You push yourself, you challenge yourself because it feels good to you. Because it reinforces that identity. People think that they that happiness comes from having an easy life. And the reality is when people don't have anything that pushes them or challenges them, I, I think that leads to a very unfulfilled life. I, I, I do agree. I think a lot of um, growth comes from challenges. It it. W- you know what I mean? Like, <clears throat> it, it's very difficult to say, like, you know, you learn something if, you, if it wasn't difficult. You know, like, I'm sure you can pull from experiences in your own life where, you know, things were tough. And then at the end of the tunnel, you know, like, you know, you, you, you learn that la- that valuable life lesson, you know what I mean, whatever that is, but it it you only appreciate it when it was something that was difficult because if you do something that's easy, there's no real learning. You know, you just know <laughs> that you can do it. So it's almost like you know, you sell sell yourself short when it's something that you know it's easy for you. Mm-hmm. But I feel like the growth really comes when it's been under pressure. It's something that Cause you, that's, you know, how it kind of forges in, into yourself that, okay, I've been through that. Now what else? And that's, you know, that's something that's valuable. That's where the valuable, that's where the value is, is when you know, you've been through some tough times and, Hmm. you know, I think for me, it's how many times does it have to be tough? (laughs) You know what I mean? Like, (laughs) like how, how, you know, how, how much does one have to go through to, you know what I mean? To continue, you know, sort of. Well, it's also like not just tough, but who's in control of that degree of toughness? Like, is it Mm. that I'm just getting thrown all these really difficult circumstances in my life that I have to, to navigate and, and deal with, or is it that I'm choosing to push myself You know, that's a very different, both are, you're learning from both those, both are challenges, but one is, is directed in a way that helps you sort of become the person that you're trying to become. 
I mean, they both actually help you become the person. Mm -hmm. But one is, I don't know, maybe that's an illusion, actually, that we have some control over the challenges in our life. Huh? Yeah. That'd be interesting something to talk about. Like, like, what do you mean when you say it's an illusion? Well, I was, I was just thinking like, I keep going back to this. Like I was just thinking about this um, Spartan race that I'm, mm-hmm. and I was like, Oh, you know, I sort of picked, that race because it's something hard, something challenging. I'm pushing myself to train for it. And like then sticking to a regular train, like I haven't trained in three days or for three days because like, well, because my son has COVID and then I've, so I was telling you before we started, my son has COVID and and this is the first time during the pandemic that anyone in the family has gotten COVID. He Which is remarkable, sick. by the way. That's that's pretty crazy. Three years, and you're a doctor, and you worked in it, and this is the first that's time it. you got it. Yeah. That's, that's amazing. So I worked in the hospital taking care of COVID patients um, for almost two years. Uh, then I worked in the clinic, and I saw you know tens of people um, every week. And I don't know. And and I'm not a hermit. Like I've gone out, I go grocery shopping, I yeah. I go to restaurants. I mean not I'm not you know, not not a ton, but it's not like I've been sheltering for three years. So anyway, he w- we tried to quarantine him <laughs> and he kept coming out of his room. He's eight. And he kept, this is his room. I wasn't going to record in his room, but he's like downstairs hanging out with the family. We just decided, we're like, we've all been exposed to him. And, and you know, I work from home now. My wife actually mostly works from home. Um, the other two kids can't go to school because their sibling has it and they have some rule. So it was just sort of like, okay, well, we'll all just hang out. And um, I keep asking myself, am I going to get it? And I'm, that's why I stopped training because I'm like, oh, I don't want to put this physical stress on my body, which is probably a good idea. But then it's also like in my head, I'm like, oh, am I going to be ready for this? And it's in June, granted. But then I'm like, what else is going to happen in my life that's going to prevent me from doing the optimal training plan that I've, I'm trying to do with this coach? And that's the real challenge. The real challenge is not signing up for the race. The real challenge is not even necessarily coming up with the training plan. The real challenge is implementing anything in your life. The real challenge is making it a reality when life happens, because life always happens. It happens all the time. Every all day. the time. Every, every second. day. Every yeah. second. <laughs> And I, that's the other reason why we started the Health Feast, Poe, is because at our conversations, it was clear that like, okay, there's just all these wonderful ideas and ideals. And for most of us, it's a challenge to make it happen. Even yeah, so when tie- we know. Right. So, you're, so just to tie it back to the original of the illusion is, so how does that apply to what you're saying? So is it that because are you saying that the illusion of being the being in shape? No, the illusion of being in control of the challenges in ah, your life. Ah, got it. The illusion of like, oh, the challenge I've created is signing up and running this race. The Spartan race. Yeah. Right. That is like a thing I want to do. Yes, it's, it's a hard thing. Um, but the challenge is actually the ups and downs of life that everyone experiences. And the context in which you experience those is like the choices you make. It feels good to want to train for a race and want to push myself to do something like that. And if I want to make that a reality, then I have that's where the the real work comes in is like figuring out, OK, I, it's not going to be ideal. So how am I going to make it happen? You know, it's been raining every day, too. I'm supposed yeah. to go on two runs every week 
with this training plan. Actually, last week was supposed to be three runs, and I and I but I and I did and I did two of them. And Wednesday it was like morning. You know, I was catching it. I was like, oh, there's an there's like I was looking at the forecast. It's like not supposed to rain in the next hour. It wasn't raining, and I go outside, and like 20 minutes in the rain, it just start uh, into the run. It starts downpouring. <laughs> <laughs> And you said, that's it. It's like, okay, you can try to control this as much as you want, but you can't really Mm -mm. control this. Um, And you just, and then I had to just let go. I just had to say, okay, I'm outside. I'm running in the rain. Am I going to run a certain speed? No, like that doesn't even matter. Am I going to, I, in fact, ran to, there's a track by our house. I was like, I'm just going to run on the track because I don't want to, like trip and fall on a trail while it's running, you know, while it's ra- while it's running, <laughs> while it's raining. I'm just going to run on the track and I'm going to do the, the whole 40 minutes. It was a 40 minute run and, and do it in the rain. Fine. And, and then about 10 minutes after that, it stopped raining again. And I was like soaking wet <laughs> and running <laughs> on this track and uh, just, acknowledging in that moment i put my arms up and i was just sort of saying to myself this is this is cool like i'm actually doing this it's not ideal in any sense and i'm just gonna appreciate that i'm out here doing this now i like i like this topic because when you aspire let's just take let's use your example of like running the spartan race so you're aspiring to do this this spartan race and then we're talking about how when you aspire to do it, it's almost like an illusion that you're creating as a goal, what you're mm-hmm. seeing in the future, mm-hmm. right? Like, okay, you can foresee that a year from now when you do the race, that's the illusion is like, and it's a, it's not necessarily a bad thing to have that illusion, right? It's when you're not doing the runs that you're supposed yeah. to do and you're not keeping your agreements. Now it becomes... Yeah. A situation where it is a real illusion it's not there's no intention behind actually doing it based right. on how often you meet those little goals of like okay i'm going to do at least three miles every other day so that i can you know by by a year from now when you yeah. do so so i have some endurance and that's it right so like the health feast now to tie it back to the original question which yeah. was <laughs> what was that what the health feast like you know, you were explaining, you know, that the health, what the healthy feast is um, for you. It's a mindset. Uh, got it. That I, I well, okay, because I feast implies like enjoyment, indulgence. How would pushing yourself and doing hard things be enjoyment, indulgence? Actually, that ties into the kind of bigger identity you have for yourself. And when you, when you live up to that, Mm -hmm. when you, when you do things in your life, when you make choices that reinforce that identity, that feels really good. That feels, yeah, that feels really good. It ties back to purpose, autonomy, mastery, all these things. When you, when, when those things resonate with the choices you're making, then it feels really good. It's a feast. It's a feast. Yeah. And I, I feel like the one thing that we both agreed upon when we first started this is that I feel like these topics is, is something, it's like universal, you know, like mm-hmm. everybody at some level experiences, um, you know, some of these challenges and, shortcomings but i feel like with the health feast this is where you come to yeah absolutely it is universal po that's that i want to say can uh, in and in the episode where we talked when you interviewed me in our second episode i didn't actually tell people like what i do i realized i didn't i realized that i mean i have alluded to it and i've taught i think i've mentioned lifestyle medicine which is which is what I practice. I practice something called lifestyle medicine. I was a trained internist, obviously. I am still an internist, internist, adult uh, medicine doctor. 
I worked in the hospital for 10 years, uh, 11 years, um, 14 years if you count residency, which you're basically working in the hospital. And then experienced that huge, huge um, change in my own lifestyle. You know, I started meditating. And then I started eating a whole food plant-based diet, not 100% of the time, but more and more and more and more of the time. Then I started asking the question, why aren't we doing this for patients? And I got certified in lifestyle medicine. I helped start a program at my medical center, a lifestyle medicine program, the 12-week program to help people eat more plants on a regular basis and move and move their body more. And then, uh, and I made the decision in my in my life that I wanted to to really well COVID came okay so I was a hot I I this was 2019 I said I'm ready to kind of pivot I got certified in 2018 in lifestyle medicine in 2018 I was thinking like how do I do this like as my full career I would sit with so many of the patients I took care of in the hospital who had strokes or heart attacks I would go back in the afternoon and I would print out booklets on plant-based eating and I would sit with them and I would ask them these questions. You know, what what's important to you in your life? Why do you want to be healthy? And and that was such a like moment of vulnerability you can imagine where they're really scared too because what's on everyone's mind in those situations is they don't want this to happen again. They don't want this to happen again. And so they're very receptive and they start thinking about this. And I would also take care of patients after they had bypass surgery and where their sternum was cut open to to bypass their. And so I'd use that as an opportunity to talk about these things. And I never saw them again. I would discharge them from the hospital. We'd have sometimes hours to hour, two hours of conversations about all this stuff, what's important to them, changes they could make. I could feel this energy where they, and, but, but, you know, I started occasionally, not always, but sometimes I would follow up with these patients on my own. I would exchange information with them. I would call them on my own. I visited some of these patients in their home. Um, I took one patient and his sister to the grocery store to show them how to shop this way. Uh, and then we made a meal together. I I brought we bought the ingredients and we made um, black bean and sweet potato enchiladas, <laughs> which is my <laughs> simple recipe. You know, I showed them because I wanted them to see that you can cook this way and the food can taste good. Um, and no, and nobody I was working with knew any of this. You know, I, di- I didn't tell anyone about this. Um, and and then I and then the pandemic came and I put any thoughts about like leaving that job out of my head. Because I felt like I was being called. By, you know, society <laughs> like needed needed me. I was taking care of patients in the hospital like that. So, so the next, you know, almost two years, I just, um, that's what I did. That's what I did. And, and then, but those feelings and thoughts never went away. If anything, they were reinforced because what I saw was people with poor lifestyle and diseases related to lifestyle were the ones getting sick and coming under my care in the hospital. And I saw people unfortunately deteriorate and die um, from COVID, you know, so that's not to minimize the disease. Uh, It strengthened my resolve. You know, today, Poe, today is Martin Luther King Jr. Day. We're recording this, right? And, and, and the other thing I, as around the start of the pandemic, I joined a group well, I'm part of a professional society, the American College of Lifestyle Medicine. It's our professional society that that represents this this group of of health professionals that want to change the healthcare system. The focus on healthy lifestyle is a foundation of health. 
And we have a subgroup called Heal, Heal, which I joined around the time of the start of the pandemic. And Heal stands for health equity achieved through lifestyle. And from the pandemic, it was very obvious, very obvious early on that certain groups, you know, in in Bay Area and San Francisco, like Latinx population, much more likely to get sick, to end up in the hospital. Mortality rate was twofold higher. Uh, nationally, we saw that with not just Latinx, but with African-Americans. So then why is that? Why is that? Well, all those lifestyle related factors, you know, all those lifestyle related diseases we see like diabetes, high blood pressure, heart disease, we see those more in the same groups. And then why is that? You know, that's when you start understanding that to have to have healthy diet, you need to have access to healthy food. And to have regular movement, you have to have safe spaces to exercise in. And that and that chronic stress is one of the biggest drivers of underlying inflammation that leads to disease. And that there are, you know, generations of Black people, for example, who have uh, what we call allostatic load, just huge amounts of stress from from racism, from overt racism, systemic racism, that adds that adds to their disease, that that adds to their risk of disease, basically. And health equity achieved through lifestyle is is this idea that when you start addressing the root cause, you you inherently have to also address the systemic injustices that lead to those inequities. So the two are instricably linked that if I want to address chronic disease and lifestyle, I also have to address food access. I also have to address systemic racism. I also have to address environmental toxins and pollution because all of those things are what are leading to the disease, which is leading to the health inequity. So... That's an incredible group of people from all over the country, really all over the world that are working, they're healthcare professionals that are working to try and make health equity achieved through advancing lifestyle medicine. And um, anyway, I wanted to reflect on that for a moment because it's MLK. Gotcha. And, and also to tell people that I do that now full time. I left, I left my medical group last fall to, to join a lifestyle medicine uh, startup. It's a it's a telehealth startup called Mora M O R A. You can find us at mora dot com. What do we do at Mora? We actually provide this type of care virtually uh, right now in five states, um, four or five states. We're in California, Florida, Texas, Ohio. Soon to be in Ohio. Soon to be in New York. Uh, but eventually hopefully every state. Uh, and this is consultation with lifestyle medicine physician and physician assistants who are trained in this, in the therapeutic use of lifestyle change for treating and reversing chronic disease. And change doesn't happen just because we tell you to do something. Change happens because of conversations. And so we lead you through disease reversal groups where you're, it's not just you, it's you and nine, 10 other people who are all on this mission to take control of their health, sharing every week their vulnerabilities, their experiences, their struggles, their successes, and celebrating each other. And I lead those groups. I'm leading a group tonight, actually. And, and I see patients one-on-one -on -one in consultation, too, in preparation for those groups or during those groups. And... It doesn't even po. It's just like how I went to that guy's house uh, and cooked enchiladas. Like that didn't. I did. No one told me to do that. That didn't feel like work for me. That felt like I was living my purpose. And now I don't even know. It sometimes it feels like a dream. Like I have. I work for someone that is aligned is, with your purpose. Aligned yeah. with my purpose. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And that didn't just happen. I think it happened because I really put that energy out there. And then, you know, that's that's what came to me. 
And but I feel very grateful, very lucky. And so Health Feast is is how I it's what I do in my day to day job. I help people find the health feast in their life. I help people make this possible and doable and sustainable because then it has such a positive impact. And I just now over the last several years, I just keep seeing more and more and more and more examples of people doing this. In fact, we're going to have um, one of my friends on friend, patient, whatever, um, <laughs> whatever. I become friends with my patients. It's I don't know if that's normal or not, but um, I but think I that's the shift in medical. I think to me, I think that's even with you know you and I. I think I reached out to you on a different. That's like, right. I connected with you in a different way. Although every, I, I do feel like, man, you're a doctor, you're a professional. And it's, to me, it's, it's sort of like a blessing to be able to reach out to you and ask you questions. And I feel like that's, it goes back to you talking about kind of connecting with your patients, you know, in a way that's not really traditional, you know, it's not a traditional mm -hmm. way of being with your, with your patient. And I feel like that's, I feel like that's what it's going to evolve to in my, my opinion that, and that goes mm. along with the mission of lifestyle medicine. Yeah. You know, can you imagine if like you had that type of rapport with your doctor, it changes it because it, it just feels like um, your doctor is invested in you. So you don't always have that feeling when you go to your doctor, you know what I mean? Like you, you feel like, all right, you go into the doctor's office and, and I'm not speaking on my current doctor now. No, no, <laughs> no, no, no. I'm just saying like it could be no, very trans I hear you. you know, it could be very transactional, you know, like you're you're mm -hmm. there to buy something and then that's it, you know, and then you're out, out mm -hmm. the door. But I feel like I feel like in the future, and I'll say this now, it's gonna be a different, it's a different um relationship that you're gonna have with your doctor. Your doc I feel like that's what I feel like with you and I talking about the health things. I feel like for, for those out there listening, you know, you kind of want to create that space with your doctor where you feel like your doctor is invested in you and that they actually are trying to keep you alive, you know, versus mm. you go to a doctor's office and it's like, all right, what kind of meds do you need? Oh, you got this? All right, boom, boom, boom. All right, have a good day. See you in a few few months. I don't that's feel the like- That's the transactional right. quality of it you were getting at. Yeah. Whereas- I feel like us, we, when we do these talks and these conversations, it's different. Like, like, could you imagine a world where you can actually have this type of rapport with your doctor where you can like, you're like invested in each other. That's a totally different, mm. that's a totally different position. You know, it's a different intention. It's a, it's a, it's a completely mm. different way of, um, of healthcare, you know? So, and that's something that we can, you know, that's uh, something that we could talk about even more. Cause if we change it in that way, I feel like, I think when, when patients feel like they, that their doctors has their invested interest in them, I feel like there's something on the line. And I feel like a patient would be like, man, you know, I don't want to let, I don't want to, you know, I want to want to let, I don't want to let my doctor down. Like, you know, there's, mm. it's just a different position, but um, yeah. I think. Yeah. I like, yeah, I, that's, I like what you said to start with, which is that you think that's the way we're going. I hope that's true. I, I want to believe that also. I think that's the way we're going because that, you know, that gives me hope for so many reasons. You know, Poe, there's a huge epidemic of healthcare workers who are burnt out. Right. Do you know this? I did not know this. Yeah. Okay. Let's talk about that. But, yeah. Well, doctors have been burnt out for, for quite some time. Every year, there's like a national survey done, several surveys done, and some specialties are more burnt out. Like primary care is very burnt out, has been and continues to be probably the most, most burnt out. And burnout, you know, in medicine, actually, there's, there's a newer term we use, not burnt out, we say moral injury. Mm. Burnout implies there's some fault of the, the person that mm. you you can't keep your flame going. Um, I don't know if it does, but people yeah. say that. And and moral injury is is thought to be a kind of better term. Is that it? One, it's uh, because why do people go into healthcare? 
so many people, I, I know so many people, you go to a room of people who are in healthcare and you ask them and they all have, if you ask the whole room, like, did you feel called to serve? You know, almost everyone will raise their hand. That same is not true if you go in a room of attorneys. Mm. And nothing against attorneys. Yeah. But that is something that bonds people in healthcare. I don't care who, you know, nurses, paramedics, doctors, because a lot of the work is very hard. A lot of the demands on you are are great. You 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 are often in situations that are very stressful um by choice and the individuals you're with both the patients and their families they put a lot of demands on you they're very the emotions emotions are high expectations are high all of these things and we do that by choice because there's a recognition that this is a, a deep need that we're helping to fulfill in society why then is there so much burnout? There's a disconnect between why people wanted to go in. They wanted to go into healthcare to to help people, to serve and to heal. And we're not seeing our patients get better. Actually, we're seeing people get sicker. You know, we talked a couple of weeks ago about life expectancy going right. down in the United States. That's because that's because of COVID and it's because of the the epidemic of chronic disease and that more and more patients are coming in. There's more needs for, for services. There's more needs for cardiac surgery, for example, and for cardiac procedures to like put stents in and hospitals and healthcare systems are being stretched very thin. And as people have been leaving healthcare, during, you know, during the pandemic, there was, I think, this heroic phase. I went through this heroic phase. We all did. We were like, yeah, we're going to do this. We're going to uh, pull up our boots, you know, whatever whatever the yeah, expression yeah. is. We're going to push ourselves and, and serve society. And then the demands have just been ongoing over and over and over again. And I think that would be okay, but what people what people are experiencing in healthcare is wow, people are just getting sicker. The system just feels so unsustainable. So rather than torment myself and subject myself to this, I'm just going to leave this. And some people have, if financially they're able to, or, or they have some other work opportunity. And when they do that, it makes the rest of the people who are in the system stretched even more thin. Right. And so to go back to what you said about like the doctor's office sometimes feeling transactional, that I think is a survival skill now. I think mm -hmm. that has become a way to survive in healthcare. And because the most readily, as I've said before, the most readily quick available treatment is a pill. And when you have such a huge volume of patients and you have such a Low amount of staff. Yeah. Low amount of staff. What are you gonna do? And so I when you started this by saying, you know, I as you said, I think that's the direction we're moving in. I hope and and want that future. And then I don't know how that future is gonna happen in our current system because you see there's there's such a disconnect there between what's currently happening and, and and to go back to burnout, like when you see constantly your patients not getting better and you're working in that environment, yeah. you know, that's why we call it moral injury, because you you can tell that what is best for the patient is, you know, on some level, I think you feel it. It's not being done. It's when I'm not doing I'm not taking optimal care because it's not possible because the system actually doesn't mm -hmm. allow me to. The system doesn't actually allow me to. That is the injury, the moral injury that, that we're experiencing. And lifestyle medicine is a, it's a breath of fresh air. I think it's the antidote. You know, it, it brings with it, I think, hope and the promise of helping people reverse disease and prevent disease and live healthy lives, um, not just live healthy lives, but live 
live lives where they get to do and and experience all the things that are important to them. That's what good health gives you. It's not just that it gives you health, it gives you the ability to to live a good life. And when you experience that, I've experienced that with patients. You know, I experienced it with that cardiac surgery patient. I went to his home and then I saw him. I I taught him how to cook that thing and 6 months later he invited me over to his father's birthday party. His father, I think, was turning 85 or something. They had it at his home. And they cooked all these plant-based dishes for the whole family. This is a Filipino family. They cooked uh, different salads. They made tofu, adobo. And that that was one of the first experiences I had uh, doing this where I, suddenly I was seeing evidence of how my couple, few hours in the afternoon could have this ripple effect in his whole family. <laughs> the impact that it, it had. Yeah. It had impact that it had, but I didn't know how I was going to do that in my, as, as a, as my life's work or my career. And it's what Jay talked about. You know, you know, I was haunted. I was haunted. Right. And I, I, I was haunted by it. And all through the pandemic, I was haunted by it. And, and then I went into primary care, Po. And <laughs> that system that you just described, I went into that. Uh, I think I had to experience that. Mm. I had to experience that firsthand. Now, I never, that was never my intention when I became a doctor to be a primary care doctor, I, it didn't really resonate with me when I was in training. Um, but that's because I think the way primary care is practiced by and large, um, and continues to be, and kind of has to be in these very short visits and you're covering a lot of information. You're basically going over illness and then managing illness. And you're doing that, as quickly as you can to get through and you're developing relationships too. I think you tell most primary care doctors will tell you that they love their job because of their patients and the relationships they get to have the patients and the trust they get from their patients. And the reason that they're burnt out is because they don't get time with their patients. Mm. They, they don't have, they, the demands on them now are so much in terms of emails volume of emails and paper, you know, it's not paperwork anymore, it's computer work, but there's so much charting computer work and messaging that the amount of time you actually spend with patients is very small. It's very, very small. And if you went into medicine because you wanted to serve and connect with people and see people get better and heal, and you're not experiencing that, you're seeing your patients actually get sicker, and you're not even spending time with them and you're giving out more medications than you've ever given before and your patients are not getting better and that's because the medications don't treat the disease they treat the symptoms of the disease they treat the numbers and you're seeing all that and you're experiencing it and then your colleagues are leaving and you you know it's this is a really it's a catastrophe it's a crisis in healthcare but i do see a future uh where where the healthcare system is focused on health it's focused on keeping people healthy and it's focused on having these just like you said relationships relationships with not just your doctor but with your social worker and your therapist and and your health coach and your dietitian and all the people that are part of your care team who are all working to make you the best version of yourself, the healthiest version of yourself so that you can live the life that's meaningful to you. That's, that's the aspirational healthcare system that, you know, we're not by any that's, means. That's the, that's the, that's there, the Spartan but, race. That's the Spartan race. Right. Like yeah. that's, that's the yeah. I think that's the a goal that one aspires to. Right. And I feel like the health feast is part of that conversation. 
you know, yeah. just, just, just part of like, wow, could you imagine that, you know, uh, you know, can you imagine a world where, you know, you have doctors that show up at your house to help you cook a meal that's going to be healthy for you? You know what I mean? Like, I mean, it's, it's, it's okay to think like, man, that'd be kind of a cool way of, you know, dealing with the healthcare system, or that's a cool way to look at the healthcare system where you have people that are really invested in your health because, mm. you know, I think we've all experienced, like I was saying earlier about the transactional healthcare, you know, it's a, and it, you know, I'm glad you spoke to the challenges that our doctors are facing now with the volume of a workload. Like I'm sure a lot of people, I mean, I think I I'm, I was aware of the like the therapy side of it. I didn't realize it was for the doctors too. You know, like I know mm. the mental health care system, mm. like there's not enough psychiatrists and psychologists mm. available now to help people with mental health. And it didn't dawn on me to even for even for your regular medical doctors too. Same thing. Oh, Poe, it's everyone. It's not. It's therapists. It's psychiatrists. It's nurses. It's respiratory therapists, it's physical, it's everyone in healthcare is stretched super thin. The demands on the system are super high and there are people leaving the system and there's just not an, even enough people in the pipeline in training because we also have uh, baby boomers that are all turning mm-hmm. of an age where their medical needs are, are more and we're not equipped there is a way out. I, I say it again and again, but if we start focusing on the foundation of health and lifestyle habits, we're going to see less disease and there's going to be less strain and stress on the system. Disease is never going to go away completely. Right. That would be wonderful, but it's not. We're right. always going to have a need for pills and for procedures. Right, right. And, you know, in lifestyle medicine, we talk about a house, like a found, like, you know, if 80% of disease is caused by 80% of chronic disease is caused by lifestyle factors, we know this. And if you were building a house, Po, and you were meeting with contractors, and you met with a contractor, and he said, I'm really good at building second and third floors, but I don't really do foundations or first floors. That's not, mm-hmm. that's not my, right, you wouldn't, hire <laughs> right, 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 hire right. that contractor but that's kind of the healthcare system right now we if i say the second and third floor are are, are medications pills procedures we're very very good like drug development best in the world surgeries procedures best in the world and and so much emphasis has put on been put on those things and that's where value is derived too like that's where the money is in healthcare. So that's where sometimes prestige is in healthcare. Oh, you're a cardiac surgeon. Mm. You know, that's you save lives. I would argue that uh, that the dietitian that teaches someone how to cook for themselves healthy food is saving that person's life for a much lower cost. Mm. And that's not how we look at it in our society or our healthcare system. In fact, we look at what well, we don't have the money for more dietitians. I, and that's I hear that, you know we don't have the money for health coaches, and that's um, that speaks to you know that speaks to our priorities mm. and our culture. It's, is it that, would you say that's like the traditional mindset yeah. of healthcare? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Mm. And the traditional mindset, not just like, I think for so many reasons, the business aspect, but the cultural aspect, the, the training piece, you know, like training as a doctor, you're trained to identify, diagnose illness treat and then manage illness. You know, that is really all the training is really centered around. It's not centered around prevention. Mm. It's not centered around coaching. None of that. None of that. None of that. So 
those skills are skills that I developed on my own or through other training opportunities that I sought out. And that, yeah, that, that change, that shift is a much bigger shift than I think. I wonder, is it a, it's a bigger shift than I think you might realize, you know, to go from a healthcare system that focuses on disease and illness and managing illness to one that focuses on preserving health. I would say that I, I, I understand what you're saying. I, I feel like one of the solutions would be just a conversation. I don't think a lot of the, of a lot of people especially in the mainstream. I don't think it's trending. I don't think it's something that's, but I think the conversation has started. I feel like I I don't know how long it's been going for, but I know that, you know, things move so fast. Information moves so fast these days that all it takes is a generation of, you know, people that are like, all right, we've had enough of the, um, the old traditional way of doing things. Like things happen so fast now in the media or in, in, and, and just the information, it's just things move so fast that I feel like it's just going to it's going to take a spark of something. And then the next thing you know, it's just going to it's going to start transitioning because, you know, like you said, the baby boomers are still around, you know, which is you know great. But I feel like there will be some and, I, and that maybe I'm just optimistic and I'm trying to be positive. But no, I, do good. Think, I love that. I love your optimism. I yeah. need the, I need to hear this. Yeah, I, I, I just feel like. There will it will happen, and it might happen in our lifetime. It might happen in our lifetime. You know, think of all the things that have happened in the last three years that we never would have thought would happen, mm. and now it's happening. Mm. You know, um, like your story no. itself yeah. is inspiring. Like you saw it for yourself, and you're making those changes, and it's a different shift. Like I feel like when you hear someone like yourself say that you decided, like you know what, this is not for me. It it wasn't aligned with the purpose that I feel like I'm here for that right there in itself is inspiring for people that are still trying to look for their own purpose. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? And then when you have someone who's trained, who you're a trained doctor that's saying like, you know what? I knew it wasn't for me. I'm going to walk away. See that I'm sure you've heard of other people's stories that inspires you to, to make those decisions. Right. So Absolutely. it might not be a grand step, you know, but I feel like, I feel like it's slowly and it will pick up momentum, you know, and I, I don't know. I'm, I'm praying that I can see it in my lifetime so that, you know, my kids get the benefit of having a healthcare system that's changed. Maybe I am a little bit, you know, optimistic about how I see healthcare in the future, but, you know, I feel like having these conversations, having this information out there, having people listen, it's going to, they're going to start looking at their own lives and, mm. you know, um, and, you know, eventually I think it's going to change. Um, so. Oh, I, 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 I'm I, with you. No, I, oh, it's definitely going to change. It has yeah. to change. It will change. And in your lifetime, of course, in your lifetime. It's, um, but I, I also say to people, I say it to, to my patients. I say it to, you don't have to wait for the healthcare system to change, to change, to right. change your own health. Right. You don't have to wait for the healthcare system to change, to change your own health. And you can look at the healthcare system for what it is. It's a valuable resource for when you get sick. It's a very valuable resource. If you have health coverage, you know, that's when you need it. You know, so I'm not telling anyone don't, don't take health coverage because you, you're, you're probably going to get sick or something's going to happen to you. You're going to need it. And our healthcare system is very good when when you need it and outside of that you know there are some parts of the health system yeah that are doing this more and more and more i mean that's why being part of american college of lifestyle medicine is so exciting for me because every time i go to the conference i went to the conference last november i see more and more and more people more more organizations, more companies, like the company I just joined, you know, like more of this is happening for sure. And you don't have to wait for the healthcare system to change, to start taking care of your own health. You know, you just listen to the health feast. (laughs) (laughs) 
So I was going to ask. Yeah. That the health feast, you know, part yeah. of my journey through the health feast or just in general with lifestyle medicine is sustainability, right? Like mm -hmm. that's a challenge for me. But we were talking uh, about, was it mindful, being mindful, what that means and, and, and practical and how things are practical, how to make it practical for, for folks who are um, trying to change their lives through health, right? Well, we, yeah, sure. We, or like maybe, well, mindfulness, I think we can just stop, pa pause for a moment and talk about that. Like, what does mindfulness mean to you? Uh, for me, let's see, mindfulness is almost like being thoughtful and being present and really like thinking of something before you're doing. I mean, I think that's that's the best way that I would describe what mindfulness means. Um, I, I, if I were to pick one word, I would say just being present in the moment. Um, yeah. That's how yeah. I would describe mind, mindfulness. I think you can... Uh you can think about very easily think about moments where you've been absolutely present, right? In a conversation, when you've been engrossed in a book or a movie, or when you've been working on something. And so it's this active, open attention to the present. It's also this idea that you're not necessarily, you're not, you're observing everything that's happening. You're experiencing everything that's happening, but you're not necessarily judging it as, as like mm. good or bad. You're just experiencing what is. Yeah. I like, I like the way that's put, like you're not setting an expectation of, of anything. So when you're that's being right. mindful, you're just, that's right. Um, taking in the information without uh, judging it. Would yeah. You say? Yeah. That's it. You're just, this is what is. It is this is what is, and you're observing it and experiencing it, because the judgment piece is really when we start having thoughts, right? Our judgments are our thoughts, and our thoughts then might dictate how we feel about something. And we might have negative opinions of something or positive opinions of something. It's okay to, to feel those things, to observe that you're feeling a certain way. It's okay to even have thoughts. It's okay to observe that you're having certain thoughts. The mindfulness piece is, is not then like getting wrapped up in that thought or that feeling and then losing sense of what's actually happening, the present moment that you're experiencing. So those thoughts and feelings are actually part of the present moment. Because if something's coming up for you, you know, that that's part of the experience. There's a witnessing that is non-judgmental versus there is, you may have a thought and then you may, you may judge that thought. You may feel very angry or upset and then get consumed with that anger and then, and then, and then have a, a series of thoughts that just go down and ruminate about that feeling of anger. And Which, then you're no longer, and you're no longer, yeah, you're no longer in the present moment. Now, let me ask you this. Now, does that cause one to ha to make decisions that negatively affect their health? Well, what do you think? <laughs> <laughs> One hundred percent. Yeah. So, so you yeah. go from being mindfulness to like, let's say you you are setting an expectation during that that moment, right, of space where you're mm -hmm. thinking of something. Could that be a trigger? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Have you ever seen like, um, or you've experienced this? You 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 were gonna do something or have some event. And then something happens so it doesn't turn out the way that you expected. You know, like either some person didn't make it or uh, or it rained or whatever. And then in that moment, you can just feel so disappointed. And then that disappointment, that'll completely shade the whole experience. You'll just 
you'll just feel foul and and in a bad mood. Or you can, as you said, not have expectations, acknowledge, oh, so-and-so can't make it anymore, and we're still going to have a great time. Uh, that's, that's one reflection I have. The other is that you said, does it impact your health? Uh, yeah, I think this is, goes back to how people, you know, maybe food, I'll say food as an example, you know, I use food to react to emotions when I'm not aware of a strong emotion or a craving, uh, then I'll just react to it. Uh, in the way that I may have always reacted to it and and not not necessarily do what's best for my health, <laughs> I guess. Right. Not necessarily do what's best for my health. That's a very easy example, but like you might it it you might say I'm gonna go running three times a week or at walking three times a week and then something happens at work where you're upset about it and you just and then you decide you're you're going to stay home and and look on your phone instead you know because you don't in that moment you just you just don't feel like doing anything you feel like doing some people say that i feel like doing something mindless mm. which can also right? be a form of coping right it's another way of coping with the but is it oh. interesting how people say mindless and we're talking about mindfulness right right and then can they compound can what do you mean can, can those choices compound where like you keep set you keep setting a goal and then you keep whatever happens you know uh, we we're talking about this earlier about setting an expectation and then when it doesn't turn out how do you respond versus how do you react mm. and then when you react does it compound like every like another bad choice I, I i'll say bad you know but it's just a choice right it's the, the way you frame it well are you why are you asking are you asking this because that you feel like that's what happens to you i think i think that's part of my thing yeah like i'll, I'll to tell me more about tell us more about that well i mean i feel like when you know like if you set a goal if i set a goal for myself and then it doesn't turn out for whatever reason whatever thing happens and then that choice doesn't happen. And then you set another goal. You set another expectation. And then that doesn't happen. And that's why I'm asking. Mm. When it compounds, is should you even look at it as, as it compounding? Maybe you should just look at it. Like for me, maybe I should just not look at it that way. Because then it feeds into like, you know. So that's why I'm asking, how do we, what practical steps that can, can, can one use, can I use to sort of have a solution for these, mm. these challenges, right? How do we, and, the, and I think that's part of what we were going to talk about today was just the practical use of the, of being mindful. And cause we talk a lot about awareness. I think we said that too earlier today. And so I was wondering like, okay, you know, what would be a solution for that? What you said reminds me of the opposite of, when I say like when you have an aspirational identity and you mm. make choices that live up to that, it feels good. Well, when you have goals or an aspirational identity or aspirational goals, and then you make choices that don't live up to that, guess what? That doesn't feel good. And each time you don't live up to that or you make a choice that's contrary to that, then you're creating a new identity you're showing yourself evidence of okay i'm i'm someone who can't do this mm -hmm. i'm someone who doesn't do this and you may not even be aware that that belief that new belief of who you are is developed or is developing you probably aren't because it's that lack of self-awareness and of, of connecting with our sort of what I would say is our, our true nature, which is awareness that sometimes leads to this disconnect between what you're doing. And if you want to disrupt that, 
you really have to, I think, get at like, what, what is it that I believe like about myself of, of who I am and what I'm capable of? What is it I really believe? What is it I really believe? Because that's what you're going to, that's what you're going to look for. If you, whatever you believe is what your brain is going to look for examples of in your life. And, and, mm. And that's what's going to manifest in your life. That's what's going to manifest in your life. So I'll ask you that, Poe. Like, I know I, you. I know. I know you struggle with your health. I know that you say it again and again. You say that's the biggest. It's the hardest thing that you've ever had to deal with. Is your health? What do you? What is it that you believe about? About what you're capable of. You know, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a question we constantly, I feel like we're, we're going over again. Um, but I, I, but it's, you know, that's part of, that's part of the process for me, right? It's, it's sort of continuing to figure out like what's going on with, with my health. Right. And, um, I've been in a lot of, you know, scary situations throughout my whole life, not just within the last few years, but just throughout my whole life, a lot of really, really, really sketchy situations. And I've, made it through a lot of those situations. Mm. Um, but when you ask, like, what do I believe um, when it comes to my health? I feel sometimes it's, it's a lonely state, you know, where you're like, um, there's nobody else. You don't have any good examples growing up of those who are like completely, you know, healthy and, you know, and then like you said, like that belief system it's like a, a set of glasses that you see the world, my lens that I see the world through. It's like when you don't see really good examples of that, it's really difficult to like embody that, right? When you're not mm -hmm. around it all the time, mm -hmm. which is why I'm, I'm really big on, you know, creating the health feast and, and gaining that support system. And like just, just our conversations, I'm going to tell you right now, is an example of what health is like I aspire to be is just the space that we created on this, this podcast and this conversation. Cause it doesn't outside of this, it, it doesn't exist, you know? Mm -hmm. And that's something that I've learned since we've started this process, right. Is that, you know, I need the support from others and, you know, getting, we spoke about this, we, you know, just getting my wife involved and trying to get my kids involved. That's a very, very tax taxing situation because you know my wife we've been married what 16 years and she's seen the evolution of my my struggle and my challenge and and I've also you know I can't say that my my journey has always been low I feel like it's high and low high and low yeah. you know yeah. it, it's never you know um it's not all it's not all like right now I feel like the process for me is a low but I also know that I, I'm going to make make it through. It's just constantly trying to peel the onion back and and continue to figure it out. I feel like it's a it's going to be part of my life's journey. I really do, and um, I feel like to get back to the belief system is I I feel like I think at, at its core there's some um, worthiness. I would say the worthiness is one of the biggest challenges. Is like, am I worthy of a healthy lifestyle? And that's, you know, it's something that's hard to share, you know, when people see you a certain way and then you're, sh you're sharing that you're, you're saying your self-worth is probably the underlying, you know, mm -hmm. um, do I deserve to be healthy? You know, when you don't have that example in your life, mm -hmm. of course, you know, and the thing that's scary for me, right, is my, my kids, mm -hmm. you know? Like if, if, if I didn't have the example of what it means to be healthy and then I'm repeating the same cycle, then of course my, my kids are going to also, they're also going to see the same cycle. And it's, what's crazy is they're part of my why, you know, mm -hmm. but yet right now in my journey, it's been, it's, I'm at a, I'm at a challenge, but you know, one thing that gives me hope is like my wife once said to me a few weeks, maybe it was last week or two weeks ago. She was like, you know, once you're, once you get going, it's like, it's really, she sees that I'm just like, I'm totally committed, totally focused. I, I just, I think, you know, I'm in my forties now and I'm just, 
I'm at a point in this stage in life where it's just like, man, does it, do I ever get overcome this? You know, like, and I think right now in the journey, I feel like right now it just seems like it's just never going to end. Like I'm just going to be constantly mm. on the hamster wheel of like up and down, up and down, you know? And, and so um, to answer your question, I think, you know, worthiness is, I think the word that stands out when it comes to that. And I feel like, yeah, am I worthy of having a life, uh, a, a healthy lifestyle? You know, and I've been in the highs where I'm just like, dude, I, I run all the time. I think I sent you a, mess, a screenshot of yeah. that was 10 years ago. Yesterday, I was running three miles. I was just like, and I remember all that. And it's like, wow, like, look at how 10 years down the road and look where I'm at again. You know, like, feel like I'm starting over all the time. And it's, we call it in my profession, like a fatigue. We call it mm. correctional fatigue. Mm. And, um, I feel like I'm at life's fatigue, you know, like I've, I've mm. just got so many things going on and, you know, it's just processing. And I know we talk a lot about like a lot of people have stuff going on and I'm not saying like, yeah. I'm the only one in the world that has a lot of stuff going on. Some, I think some people are better at managing it. Um, but yeah, sometimes it's just, you know, the only way out is through, um, I'm a strong mm. believer of that. Like, I feel like this is part of you know, my personal process is I, I have to go through all this and then come out of it at the other end with a learning lesson, you know, but I feel like the fatigue is like, man, how many times do I got to go through this? You know, mm. like, that's the question I ask myself. It's like, okay, when is enough going to be enough? Do I have to have some medical condition, which is something that I don't want, you know, but, mm. um, but like I said, I really value this space because I don't have an opportunity outside of this space, you know, to sort of get the download of like what's going on and just having you available is just, and just having this conversation, I feel like I, I still am learning. And even though right now I'm not on a high or it's victorious, you know, I, I feel like sharing this is victorious, like, because it's kind of like something that most people I, you know, would talk about, I mean, to say something that you're challenged in and for people to listen and, and say, wow, you know, that's pretty, that's a victory in itself because I would normally not share this, you know, but um, I know there are people out there that do struggle with, you know, self-worth. And I just feel like just saying that out loud, you know, I feel like it's in itself is a victory. Hmm. Wow. Po. This is, this is a, a wonderful space. First of all, let me say that we've created, and uh, I feel very privileged and grateful to have it with you too. And I absolutely a hundred percent think that you're worthy of good health. I know that's not, you didn't ask that you asked if you believe you're worthy. And I want to tell you, I believe that with every fiber of my being, I, wouldn't be sitting here having this conversation with you if I didn't believe that. Not just you, Poe. I believe everybody is worthy of good health. To be honest, I don't I don't know I don't know how you convince yourself of that worthiness. I don't know, because it sounds like you you're not sure if you can answer that question. Uh I think right now because it's at a low, it's easy to, to not know, right? Because I haven't, you know, it's just been really challenging lately, you know, and mm -hmm. I haven't been taking those steps, you know, and I mean, I think I take little steps, but there's just, like I was talking about earlier, if, if one can, if one can compound, you know, the, the decisions of not taking care of their health, you know, that's, that's, that's how sometimes I feel like it's like a, it's, it's, it's now uphill, you know what I mean? Versus like, it can completely change when it's going downhill, when it's easy to, you know what I mean? Let it, cause now you're going downhill. It's easier going downhill, but I feel like right now in my health journey, it's, it's going uphill it's going again, uphill. you know? So, um, yeah, it's going to be interesting yeah. to see. I mean, like right now I, I don't see it. Like I can't see it, but I, I, but I, I do have hope that it's going to get easier. You know, it's just, 
got to go through the grind again, you know, like back into the, and I, I, you know, we were talking about this, like exercise, you know, how we frame it, mm-hmm. how we view the word exercise. Mm-hmm. I, 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 mean, mm-hmm. I have to admit, like, there's some of that in that too. It's like, oh man, it's a grind again. But the truth, the truth of the matter is when I'm in my highs, it's like, it's not a grind because you know, it yeah. feels good, you know, mm-hmm. and I've been there too. You know, I just feel like, like right now, I mean, we were talking what last April it was, it was last year in April when we started having to come maybe yeah, April, May, May even. Okay. Yeah. So it wasn't when I was in my highs, I was walking. I mean, I was exercise. I mean, I was, you know, I was going to the gym. I was eating healthy. And right. within a few months that shifted. It's, mm. it's become now it's become, it's the opposite. So I feel like, you know, well, I mean, you called it fatigue. I call it burnout. Yeah. In some respects, you know, because you've had so many ups and downs over the, over the years, highs and lows, uh, that you're feeling that you're feeling that. And maybe the question of worthiness is not, I mean, Poe, you're definitely worthy. It's more the question of, will you succeed? You know, like you said, will it just be a lifetime of ups and downs? Or will it ever be, will I get to a period of time where I'm, I'm kind of on cruise control? Mm. Like maintenance, you know? Maintenance, maintenance. Maintenance mode, I would call it. Maintenance, maintenance. That's what we call it, actually. We call it maintenance. And doesn't mean there won't be lapses or relapses. There are, but you you kind of quickly learn from that and, and get back into maintenance. I would say right now you're in like a very big relapse phase. Yeah. Right? But you're also very motivated. You're also very motivated. And you also have a lot of knowledge. You also have a lot of knowledge and experience. When I think about you, Po, I sort of the pieces needed for someone to be successful is that they need to, they need to be motivated. They they need to think it's important. They need to have some, what we call self-efficacy. So they need to know like how to do what, what they, to be Mm -hmm. successful. So they need to have skills to, if you're talking about cooking, meal prepping, Mm -hmm. exercise, whatever you're talking about, meditation need to have you, you have a lot of, background now you you've been through different programs immersion training you have you talk to me um then what's missing there's one piece that people need it's not just that they think it's important they also have to believe that they will be successful they have to believe that they'll be successful and and so that's one thing i hear from you is that you're Right now, when you're at a low, like that's not clear to you because it's such an uphill grind. It feels that way. It feels like there's so much in your life, in the way of challenges, in the way of barriers. And to your point about burnout or fatigue, it's not just you experiencing it. It's your family. Yes. Your family that has been on this journey with you, your wife, your children, they have seen and experienced the ups and the downs and now they're seeing you want to go back up and they're like we've been through this before now i would argue they haven't been through this iteration exactly right you know and and that's that's one thing i want you know to emphasize is that you 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 have been on a journey but it's not for all it's not for not, you know, yeah. you, you have learned all these things. You have encountered all these people. You have had all these experiences. And I believe, strongly believe that it is all building. Mm. It is all building to something. As Oprah Winfrey <laughs> says in that <laughs> motivational speech, there's a bigger dream just waiting for you to step into it. Just waiting. Just waiting for you to step into it. God has a bigger plan for you and for me than we even know. 
you know right so you some of this is surrendering and saying you know i am at a low right now and i believe that there is a bigger dream just waiting for me to step into it that this has been building to something like rebuilding that foundation reason. yeah 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 and this time is different i know that's like the, that's what <laughs> the attic says you know, this time is different, I swear. Um, no, but I believe that because this time is different. No, tell me in the last times, have you have you had a podcast? Yeah, this is you definitely different. Explore these aspects <laughs> of your health? No, I don't think so. I know so, you know? So, and I know from your story that this time is different because you, you treated your health, you looked at, um, it very differently in the past to to the point where very different. yeah very different very different so you are not seeing the results you're not experiencing them right now um and your behaviors and your habits aren't aligned yet right and that is the process that we are going through together we're figuring out how to make this possible, sustainable, doable in your life. To bring it back to the very beginning of the conversation, you know, it's that mindset. How do I have a health feast mindset in every aspect of my life? How do I ask myself, how am I going to make this? The question shouldn't be like, what is the result I want? But the question should be, how can I do this in a sustainable way? And in asking that question, it you ask, what is it that I enjoy doing? What feels good to me? But you also ask, like, how can I create systems in my life that are possible? And those systems necessarily have to involve your family. They have to involve the people that you interact with on a regular basis. Because if they don't, then that's going to be a source of, of, of friction. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. going to be a source of friction. And that, you know, that uphill climb is going to, be even harder if there's friction on that uphill climb then guess what you you may very well may not on the other hand if you remove that friction you also you also maybe don't make the climb so uphill right it becomes flatter it's not even just about removing friction it's about changing the actual the incline. incline the incline the incline right the incline right, right. <laughs> The incline. And so, you know, that's something we, we will uh, address more. But I think kind of your family, you and your family are, are burnt out by Poe. Poe's health. <laughs> For real. Poe's health journey. Right? And and that's maybe that's understandable, but it doesn't, you know, it doesn't necessarily mean that you can't move past that. No. You just have to, you just have to acknowledge that, first of all. And then you have to you have to respect that too. You have to your changes can't just be about you, Poe. Right. And you know, it, it, and I heard that in our con our first conversation is that like your third child was born and you were going to the gym six hours a day and like finding friends to watch the baby. Yeah. yeah. Because it was about you. Right. Not that it's wrong for Poe to prioritize his own health, but it's it, it's a know, balance. You're not yeah, you're not doing a, it in a vacuum, exactly. Right, right, right. It's a balance of prioritizing your health versus you know your family's needs. Like there's so much behind that. Checking in with your your wife, you know, you got to always check in with your significant other to see, hey, is there something that you we need to you know? So yeah, I mean, and it's this constant adjusting, readjusting, you know, and making sure that you're not leaving anyone out. You know, because yeah. I feel like there is that level of balance that you need when you're on pursuit, when you're pursuing a health goal and prioritizing your health. It like you've we've talked about this is just getting, you know, your partner in board on board with it, you know, like just making sure like, hey, you know, this is a journey. And, and it's just I think, like you said, man, it's just there's a fatigue involved um, with my wife and the family and. Now it's like sitting down and having a conversation about it again, you know, like, you know, where does this stand and, you know, 
what can we do together as a family? Because I, you know, quite honestly, I've I've been in the situation. You know, we've I, there was a period in my life where we were all going to go to the park and walk. You know, mm-hmm. it's just revisit. It's just getting back to that to that conversation with my family. Okay. Okay. Well, I think that's a good goal for you. What do you think this week is to maybe start that conversation? I know you've been having that conversation. I know there's a lot going on in your life. So sometimes it can feel like there's no space to have that conversation. And yet that is so crucial for you to start to make changes in your life, to create systems in your life that are going to really promote the good, the healthy choice. Yeah, for sure. I think systems are important. You know, we talked about that. Um, and a lot of it is just getting it, just execute, just get it done. You know, that's the other thing. It's just exe- yeah. it's just getting the task done versus, yeah. you know. Yes. Um, yes. You're not always going to feel, I mean, we talk about health feast, it should feel good. And that's true. But there are also times, plenty of times when I don't feel like, I don't yeah. feel like getting up. I don't feel like I want to hit snooze. I want to stay in bed. I want to, I, then if I do that, I won't get my meditation in. And if I do that, then my whole day, I'm going to experience it differently. I might be more reactive. I might. So I have to push past that feeling for, I would say, the greater good, my greater good, the greater good of like everyone in my family. And. There are different ways you can do that, but, uh, you know, getting out of your head because getting out of your head and your body and just doing the thing, just doing the thing. You do. Yeah. I'm a big fan of Mel Robbins. Do you know Mel Robbins? No. You don't? No. Okay. I'll send you a couple. She has her own podcast, which is wildly successful now. She started several months ago, but. Um, but I'll send you a couple conversations she's, she's had in the past. I think they're really good to listen to. And her, her tips are very user-friendly, you know, her, the behaviors. And one of them is the five second rule, which is basically, you know, before you, when you think about doing something, whatever it is, like the thing that you ideally want to do and, and, and should do, you're going to convince yourself not to do it (laughs) and to do something else. So she says, as soon as, before you even have that dialogue, you just start counting down in your head, five, four, three, two, one. And when you get to one, you do the thing. And it, it works for several reasons. And I do this too. Honestly, it's one of the things that's helped me the most in, in getting up when the alarm goes off is it get, it gets you out of your head and the act of counting down is actually an action. You know, it's, yeah. you, you're already, you already have some forward momentum when you start counting. So sometimes, you know, you ask this a lot, Poe, you say like, I just feel, I don't feel motivated. Yeah. And, and motivation often follows action, right? So once you start doing something, you feel more motivated. That yeah. is a hundred percent true. So then the question is, how do you start? Well, you start by just ignoring your feelings, getting out of your head, and just starting. And that could be, and the 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 behavior, the the kind of programming piece of it that to be successful is you don't you don't start and do something that's insurmountable. You make that goal or that activity or that behavior pretty doable, you know, possible for you, meets you where you're at. And when you do it consistently, then you start creating evidence in your life that you are the type of person that can do this thing consistently. You are the type of person that prioritizes your health. You are the type of person that shows up when you say you're going to show up. You are the type of person that picks yourself. You know, we're always waiting for someone else to pick us. Right. Pick yourself. Yeah, I, I could say that 
I've done that before getting up at 3 a.m. to get ready for work <laughs> where you're like, all right, yeah. the alarm goes off. That's right. All right. In five seconds, you know, I'm going to get up right. and then you just do it. Now I just got to apply that to, you know, isn't it interesting though? Like yeah. <laughs> if it's work, if it's work, you have a much easier time. Why is that? That's a really good question. There's a, well, there's an obligation, right? Uh huh. You have an there agreement. You go. Yeah. You have an obligation to your job or you have a, there's obviously an expectation for you to be on time, you know, and, and there's there. consequences. There's consequences. Well, like if you didn't show up to work repeatedly, you might lose your job or, right. you know, you and then that's something. your, there's a loss. It's your livelihood. Yeah. So then you have to ask yourself, what are the consequences when I don't show up for my personal uh, commitments to myself? Wow. And we don't think about that. No. You just think, Yeah. So that's what I want you to start do this week, Po. Is just have start having more conversations, you know, with the family, or maybe just start with your wife. I know you been you do that all the time, but really yeah. frame it in the way of like, I want to, I want to acknowledge the the kind of trauma that I may have caused you, <laughs> that I've caused you. Just acknowledge the trauma that I've caused you and and that, you know, my goal is I know in alignment with your hope for me, which is to be healthy. That's what your family wants for you. Or That's even, what your family wants for you. I was just thinking of how I can open it up for my wife to have any suggestions. Like, you know, being this. That's true. You know, like, what do you think? You know, I think that's one way that I can discuss it. Oh, I love that, Poe. You know, let's see what her input is on how I could be successful versus what I think, you know, could make yeah. me, make me be successful. Maybe she can give me some feedback of like, you know, this, you should do, we should do this or we should do that. You know, and therefore it makes it more of a two way conversation. That's something different that I haven't done in the past, you know? Yeah. It's uh we do that with my kids a lot. Um, I do it with my wife too. We learned it from this kind of parenting book we read and which is, uh, Rather than just telling them like, oh, we should do things this way, we do a brainstorming session yeah. where everyone can suggest something and there's no ideas are off the table. We write down, I mean, it doesn't mean we'll do, it's like, what do you want for, what are we going to have for dinner? And someone could say candy. I'm going to write down candy, but we're not going to have candy for dinner. Right. <laughs> right, 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 right. Yeah. But that way everyone feels heard. And exactly in that process, you learn things and ideas that you yourself might not have thought of. And everyone feels ownership in the process. There's an agreement to why you're doing what you're doing. And when your wife and your kids feel like they have some ownership in your health, in the process of getting you healthy, they're going to feel more invested in it as opposed to whether, you know, you just tell them, uh, I'm doing this, this, yeah. this, and this, I need yeah. you to accommodate me. Yeah. And then in turn, that's a great idea. Po. That's yeah. a great idea. And then open it up for a family health goal. You know what I mean? Versus then, oh, then, yes. Cause then we're all, we all have input on what we think. And it'd be good for me to see what my kids think of, health and why you know is it important for them to keep themselves healthy which is something that's unheard of with the way i was raised right nobody really, <laughs> we never talked about stuff like this <laughs> you know yeah. so i feel like if if i can get an idea of what they believe is healthy for them i think it changes the conversation in the house because now we're all talking about what we believe is healthy for you know and obviously my wife and i are the examples really you know and if like i was talking about earlier about how you know if we're if we're making the right choices when it comes to our health and that, you know, that it all, it, those are the types of habits that I hope that we create for them going moving yeah. forward, you know? So, uh, since they're home today, I think as soon as I get off our, you know, our, our conversation, I think now today would be a good day to do that. Yeah. Cause everybody's home and then we can go from there. 